in this moment of sacred worship, we want to remember some generals, some heroes of the faith that in 2018 heard the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. There's quite a long list of heroes and you received a memorial program. I just encourage you to take that. And as we honor the families that are here, I just encourage you to just privately pray for them. So many of us have done many military funerals where at the cemetery, officers come and play taps and present an American flag to the widow or to the family. And today in like fashion, these are men and women who gave their lives to the army of God. Many of them entered ministry when spirit-filled churches were relinquished to the wrong side of the tracks in small areas. And because of their faithfulness, when they went to heaven last year, the majority of Christians around the world are spirit-filled. We stand on the shoulders of giants. And they've passed the baton to you, to me, and may we be found faithful. The executive presbyters are going to come, and I'm going to read the names of the credentialed holders that went to heaven in 2018. And I know many of these are so special to you, but in this solemn moment, if you would just keep it solemn, and at the end, we're going to honor them with a standing ovation. In memory of Joyce Amos, ordained February 22nd, 1931, when she was born, and then passed away September 15th of 2018. Joyce Amos. If there's family here, if you would stand. Clarence Chuck Bates, ordained, born August 12, 1931, and passed from this life in July 5th of 2018. If the family would stand if you were here. Thomas Vance Bauer, licensed, born October 5th, 1941, and passed from this life August 18th, 2018. The Bauer family is here if you would stand. Leona Benegas, licensed, born June 12, 1924, and passed from this life January 28, 2018. The Benegas family is here if you would stand. Bob L. Benson, ordained, born April 20th, 1930, and passed from this life January 21st, 2018. The Benson family is here if you would stand. Willie R. Boyd, ordained, born September 27th, 1922, and passed from this life December 19th, 2018. The Boyd family is here if you would stand. Sean P. Brockway, licensed, born September 10th, 1971, and passed from this life August 13th, 2018. The Brockway family is here if you would stand. Lee Butcher, licensed, born July 24th, 1938, and passed from this life October 16th, 2018. The Butcher family is here if you would stand. Kenneth Creason, licensed, born July 30th, 1926, passed from this life May 5th, 2018. The Creason family is here if you would stand this morning. Carol W. Elkins, ordained, born October 24th, 1927, passed from this life March 1st, 2018. The Elkins family is present, if you would stand. J. 
Jack Ellsworth, ordained, born July 19th, 1925, and passed from this life October 5th, 2018. If the Ellsworth family is here, if you would stand. David Gold, licensed, born January 12th, 1963, and passed from this life May 21st, 2018. If the Gold family is here, if you would stand. Richard Holder, ordained, born September 12th, 1945, and passed from this life March 18th, 2018. If the Holder family is here, if you would stand so we can honor you. Jackie Martin, ordained, born October 26th, 1936, and passed from this life April 19th, 2018. If the Martin family is here, if you would stand. Viola G. Redout, licensed, born April 2nd, 1919, passed from this life August 26th, 2018. The Redout family is here if you would stand. Don Sisk, certified, born June 3rd, 1944, and passed from this life January 21st, 2018. The sixth family is here. If you would stand, we honor you. Kenneth Stafford, ordained, born December 14th, 1932. Passed from this life March 24th, 2018. The Stafford family is here. If you would stand, we honor you today. Earl Bud West, ordained, born October 26th, 1925, passed from this life October 24th, 2018. The West family is here if you would stand. Donald Williams, licensed, born June 25th, 1935, passed from this life August 23rd, 2018. The Williams family is here if they would stand. We also have spouses of ministers who passed away on the back side of your page. Those are listed. I'm just going to read those names. And if you're with the family, if, if you would stand. Martha Benson, spouse of the late Bob Benson. Virginia Bobbitt, spouse of the late Dwayne Bobbitt. Juanita Davenport, spouse of Billy Davenport. Juanita Davis, spouse of the late Claude H. Davis. Clyde Duncan Hurt, spouse of the late Harlan Duncan. Dorothy Dutton, spouse of the late Carl Dutton. Martha Ellington, spouse of the late W.J. Ellington. Wanda Gunter, spouse of the late Dewar Gunter. Rosemary Harris, spouse of the late Daryl D. Harris. Susan Lepke, spouse of the late J. Walter Lepke. Gloria Lish, Spouse of Roy Lish, Jr. Lydia Mayfield, spouse of Raymond Mayfield. Verena Piercy, spouse of the late Cecil Piercy. Lois Riggs, spouse of the late Paula E. Riggs. Edwina Simpson, spouse of the late William A. Venable. And Vita Dane Williams, spouse of the late Donald Williams. Each one of the names that were presented on the screen, the flyer, and were read today were integral members of this family called the Oklahoma Assemblies of God. And as these families who stood now remain seated, I believe it would just be proper. The Bible says to show honor whom honor is due. The sacrifices that were paid by you, your spouses, financially, time-wise, in ministry, 
can never be calculated this side of heaven. But we would like to honor you today with a standing ovation. Church, can we honor these heroes? Thank you. You may be seated. I would just like to say we are so grateful that all of these family chose to worship with us today. And once you are a part of the Oklahoma District family, you can never escape. You are always a part of the family. Nothing can separate you from the love of this great family of believers and ministers. We hope you feel that today. We gathered this morning to worship. Can we give it up for this worship team? They bless my heart. We come around the Lord's table. We honor those that have gone on before us. And now we're ready for the word. Well, somebody's excited. Our district superintendent, uh, Pastor Frank Cargill, is going to come in just a moment. Our assistant district superintendent, uh, he cannot be here today, this morning, Unless he slipped in, he's not feeling well. And so pray for Pastor Craig. But he prepared a, a, a short multimedia presentation about all the hats that Pastor Cargill and Sister Cargill wear. And so turn your attention to the screens for the Cargill hats. Aren't you glad we have a superintendent that looks good in a hat? Uh, before we have Pastor Cargo come up, I'm going to ask uh, Sister Linda if she would join us here on the, the platform. Uh, behind any successful pastor is a surprised wife, and we have the most wonderful first lady, uh, Linda Cargo. Would you join us here on the stage? It's a beautiful woman of God that graces our district. She travels, uh, crisscrosses this state and the nation. And we just wanted to present you with uh, flowers, Sister Linda, and thank you for what you do for the Oklahoma District Council. First Lady Linda Cargill. I know many of you enjoy Pastor Appreciation Day that happens October, 
and an email was sent out by our, our district leaders, and uh, they asked if you would show your love and appreciation to the Cargills today. We know Pastor Cargill's heart because uh, he shares it with us as leaders in the Executive Presbytery, and he wants time for the Word and time for the Holy Spirit to move is his priorities. That touches my heart. So at the end of the worship experience today, ushers are going to be in the, the back of the worship center today, and if you brought a card, if you brought a check, or if you just want to drop off your credit card or whatever to bless the cargos today, you can insert that in the buckets at the end of the service. But before today's over, would you please come and just hug Pastor Cargo and Sister Cargo? Uh, the workload on them is heavy. They have a heart to see every person in Oklahoma find Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And I want you just to open up your hearts as Pastor Cargo comes. He has a word on his heart. Would you let it fall on good ground? And would you show our district pastor your love and appreciation as he comes this morning? Thank you so much. It's very kind. Thank you. I've asked the musicians to help me just a moment. And um, so right before I open the word, um, some of what I am going to be centered on is contained in an expression that will be known uh, maybe to everyone who's 50 years of age and above. I'm not sure how to quite do this, but it, it, it fits with this morning and it fits with what we've just done. So if you know it, I want you to jump in. This isn't intended to be a solo. And um, I have a feeling most of you will. And if you really get excited about it, that'll be fine too. We'll, um, we'll just turn the rest of the service over to the Holy Ghost. And that'll, that'll be fine. It goes like this. Well, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven. Oh, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's home, and I can't feel at home in this world. Any, oh, one more, would you, oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? From heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world any and if you feel at home in this world, you better change, because this isn't it. The face of the Oklahoma Assemblies of God is truly diverse. And so many times, Linda and I have that opportunity to see it in a way that is unique that very few of you have such an opportunity. And um, a good friend of mine who pastors here in Tulsa, one of our AG churches, the name of the church is the Far East Mission Church. And um, I've had the privilege of preaching there on several occasions. They uh, I, I think the last Sunday, not all that many months ago that I preached for them, uh, we had over 600 people. And uh, 
They only speak English to humor me. The entire congregation is from Myanmar, which was formerly known as Burma. You may not be aware that we have that strong of a congregation in Tulsa, Oklahoma. One of our ordained ministers, Pastor Chin Kam, I have asked him to join me on the platform as a row of all of his pastoral staff here. I've asked Pastor Com to uh, pray for me this morning. I, uh, I do not want him to pray in English, but he will be praying in Zomi. And um, I so highly value this brother and his uh, wonderful family and his pastoral staff that's here today. They and their church are members of the Oklahoma District Council of the Assemblies of God. I just want you to understand that. Not of some other group or an ethnic or a language or they're part of us. And if you would, Pastor, uh, I know how you all pray. And I need that this morning. Thank you, Pastor. How long can I pray for? Okay, let's pray in other tongues. I'm going to pray in my dialect, and please join with me in spirit. Hallelujah! Harakashima la la kashida da la la kashada. To Papasi at Oklahoma AG District Superintendent Reverend Frank Cargill inuntak na hangkalunda mi. Azi Linda Hansang Lung Damung To Pabasian, Oklahoma District Kaum, AG Camp Hansang Lung Damung To Pabasian, Tunina Zat Natapa, Nang Manung Zasak Laitan, Crossing Beta Domuba, Kamsi Beta Nadomuba, Tan Shindo Winopia, De Ne Atetapan, Winging the Opian Beta Domuba, Tunina To Panangma, Satan in Amta, and not by my out to Pabasian, Nangma Camp Panampai. Tagumaha Tang Hilo, Vanglia Nahang Zong Hilo, Kahada Tabek on the Mount Tun Zodi Huchi Topa, Nangma Vanglia Nang Tung Sakta in Tunina Topavisian Tapa Tunga, O Pavisian Kinyam Kiatakina Kahut Kangahi, Nangma Ka present Topavisian Tunina Nakasiang Toina Nang Semin, Akamamuk Teng Zangin, Mipia Din Zangin Topa, Oklahoma, Revival Halo, Nalian Pingum Kik Tahen. Babasian USA gama khalo nalian pingom ta hen lei tung bo bong lo kik ta hen aju sa sweet revival to babasian nong pian sang na o pensacola to babasian brownsville revival pa to pa nong pian sang khalo na tengom kik ta hen tunin ko te ke na to pa tunin hi khalo nang tung kik ta hen jai sum in to halwei kong yen ke ku hi babasian na ta pa i leadership to pa nang nong pi line ha siang to om pi in por pi hen pe to pa ong tak suak sa kik ta hen Oh revival ng tung sakik tayo to pa kalo na na sepita ng tung sak tayo to pa oh kalo na White House pa ni Capitol Hill sa to pa oh Supreme Court ah Pentagon ah to pa ba siya New York ah UN ah to pa ba siya United Nations oh office tayo to pa ba siya ng mga sak tayo pa ba siya hi gama ng mga kyang para ang pay revival attack ng tung sakin to pa awaken ng tung sakin to pa tuni na to pa ng mga kong enuhi ng mga kyang kikong to pa Namin tanda rin ang sa min mi campaign jay sun to pa hiji na kugin na kam campaign na to pa sa lay campaign ng mga mga tahen pata pa kasi ang to minta to pa ang kia pung tunik kalungod kami kasag di ng to pa ng mga kamalte ang lungdamu na tapa jay sun minta to pa kapiyahi lungdam tungkol to pa hi congregation han ng to pa lungdamu we ask all these things in Jesus name amen 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 thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor. Proud of our family. And um, I just want this group of people to know how thankful I am for, for them and 
not only for this congregation, but it might surprise you to know that out of Tulsa Far East Mission Church, we now have parent-affiliated churches all across this general council that are attributed to the Oklahoma District through the Far East Mission Church and Pastor Chincom. And I don't know some, how, many, how many Burmese, it's a large number now, Across the nation, 27 Myanmar Assemblies of God churches, and much of the center is right here in Tulsa. In the Word of God, you will find an expression that is, is used by the weeping prophet, Jeremiah. During the opening part, the revelation of the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah and spoke these words that I would like to become immortalized into our hearts this morning. Not only for him, but for you. The opening chapter, verse number five, if you're following in the word of God in the book of Jeremiah, now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you and appointed you a prophet to the nations. Ladies and gentlemen, would you mind to say after me, I am a prophet. Now I know that's going to mess up some of you because you think the five-fold gifts are past. And sometimes we become very skittish and right now some of my theologians are squirming in their seat. Where is he going? I just want you to know that the days of the apostle and the prophet are not over. They are not past. God still wants his church and his people to be at the leading edge of the word of God for the generation in which we live. And the voice of the apostle and the voice of the prophet. While I don't go around hanging certain titles and I would not want you to do that. I do want you to be aware that God uses his people and it's not something that should be relegated to the back room to say this is no longer relevant because just as we believe in the role of the pastor and the evangelist and the teacher, so must we believe that God has ordained the apostles and the prophets to be a voice that is yet speaking to today's society. <laughs> Assemblies of God, let's not neglect the gift that has been placed within our body. Now, there are times in, in our way of thinking where, whereby we want to simplify, and I think simplification is certainly commendable. But if we are to fulfill the words that are spoken here to Jeremiah, there must come a time in our lives as a church where we are willing to dare to dream. What about you? Do you really believe that God knew you before you were formed in the womb of your mother? Do you? Do you believe that God already knew something about you before you were born? Did he consecrate you? Did, did he have his hand upon you? Did even as we read of John the Baptist episode and as we read of others, you do really believe that? I do. I don't understand 
the direction that God leads. I really don't. But I think it's time for this church to wake up to the fact this world is not our home. And if we're going to accomplish what God wants us to, we're going to have to step out of the natural and out of the norm and believe God for the impossible and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit and the revelation of prophetic word and believe God for miracles and signs and wonders. They need not be relegated to a foreign field of the assemblies of God. They need to be happening in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma by the church that is on fire for the cause of Jesus Christ. Dare to, just dare to dream. You know, the possibilities for leadership, and I include all of you in that number, they explode explode when your abilities are coupled with the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. Do not depend on your own strength. You will fail. I believe in knowledge and I believe that it's important to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Absolutely. There was a time in our fellowship where it was somewhat looked down upon if one wanted to pursue education. My generation grew up with the words ringing in our ears. You don't have time to go to college. You don't have time to further your education. Jesus is coming, so get out there, boy, and preach. My grandpa believed that. He started First Assembly of God in Salisaw, Oklahoma, and I have some of my family here today that can verify some of this. Papa Callahan believed that this, who was the baby of that generation, of all of his grandchildren, I was the last, and he believed, he believed that I was called to preach. He believed it before I did. And so every time we would go to their house, and I was but a child, we played a game. We didn't play Monopoly, that had dice. God knows we didn't play cards that had the devil's emblem on them. But there was one game we could play and we played it with fervor. Do you know what it was? Church. Now, I almost hate to use that analogy because some of you will say, well, is he encouraging us to play church? No, hear me out, hear me out. I had the wonderful privilege of being almost every time when the grandkids did this, I was the preacher. And on one particular occasion, probably about the age of five, Papa Callahan pulled a dollar out of his pocket and said, son, take up an offering. If you're going to preach, you got to learn to receive an offering. And I received my first official $1 for preaching in Papa Callahan's living room. There was something down deep. It said in my heart, and many of you are sitting in this room, who you can say and trace your heritage back. To say there's no question, God, God has his hand on me. Now, you may not have done it by the form of playing church. Because some of you in this room did not really come to Christ until after you'd gone a whole different path. And then you circled back in. But I've got news for you. Even you, God knew who you were before you were born. Why you had to travel the trail you did, I don't know. There are those who want to say that we will be a product of our ancestry. And, and we, we even heard that. And I, and I agree to the relevant statements that were made in our leadership meeting yesterday with regard to we look like those with whom we share DNA. We, we do. 
But don't ever allow your DNA to determine your future because God's Holy Spirit has a way of changing the very DNA of your being. It is said that if you are born in a home where that one parent is an alcoholic, there's a 30% chance that you will be an alcoholic. If you're born in a home where both parents are alcoholics, it's close to an 80% chance that you will be an alcoholic. But sitting in this room today are some people who had that exact thing happen to them, and yet they stand today by the glory and grace of Almighty God. They're not an alcoholic. They've been born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. So I ask us today, don't allow your past to determine your future. If God knew you before you were born, then it's time for us to start to dream, the dream that God would have for our lives. Pentecostal leadership must remain aware of those who follow. And the bond forged through the priority of healthy relationships and sensitivity to human needs becomes a symbol of unity that is demonstrated through the trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I say that to lead you to this point. People, not programs, must be the thrust of everything we do in this fellowship. We're good at organizing programs. We're, we've become strategic. We, we pursue, and I mentioned about education. Thank you, thank you. There, there's a couple of people in this room who are graduating with degrees here in just a couple of weeks. I am, I am so proud. I am, I am so proud of them. And I say, thank God. But ladies and gentlemen, don't ever become so infatuated with programs and education that you learn to lean upon them rather than leaning upon the God who knew you when you knew nothing. It was that moment whenever God reached out his hand and, and changed our lives and, 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 and transformed us in such a, such a powerful way that has come to dominate who we are. And so I ask you today to join me, to join me in this journey where the objective of life becomes to pursue the will of God for what God wants of you. Now we're all different. And we get ourselves into trouble when we try to be like someone else. Some of you have heard me admit this. I'll try one more time because it might be beneficial. I was a young pastor, very young pastor, at the age of 23 and attended a pastor's conference so I could learn to be a pastor. I was senior pastor. No, not I'd already been youth pastor. I was senior pastor. And the guy speaking was Tommy Barnett, pastor of West Davenport, Iowa. And I was convinced that the only way to build a church was to buy a bus. It's the only way. He changed that after he went to Phoenix, but be that as it may. Um, I was convinced that was it. So I went home to my little group of people and no one bought the vision. So one day I saw a used hippie van, Volkswagen, and I thought that's the beginning of our bus ministry. And I knew everyone would do it. So by faith I bought it. When I came back and announced it to the church and said, I bought our first bus. Let's, let's step in and pay for it. They voted not to do it. The problem was, I didn't tell them. I already owned it. 
I'd already put my money on it. Now, I tell you that because sometimes you can get yourself in trouble. But please, ladies and gentlemen, learn to handle the adversities. Now, that could have been a determining point in my life where I could have said, woe is me. I've spent my own money and the church isn't going to do it. I could have gotten upset with the board. I could have gotten upset with members. But instead, I just let Linda get upset with me. We paid for that sucker. We drove it a little while until we blew an engine. And then we took it to a neighboring town and had a guy repair it. And so we paid for it again. But I was determined. God had called me and there was a job he had me to do. And just because that wasn't the right direction, I didn't get mad at everybody else and mad at leadership and say, well, I'm out of here. I guess I should have gone into another profession. No. But hear me, friend. Don't stop dreaming. There may be times that you will pause and say, man, I don't know if that was a dream or a nightmare. But the moment you stop Dreaming is the moment God can no longer use your creativity to fulfill the will of God for where he has placed you today. You may, you may have to make adjustments. You may have to turn and go a different direction. But, but dream. Dream and dream bigger than who you are. I think I'm safe enough at this time of life to tell you that my dad wanted me to learn everything necessary to be a man. And that included changing the oil, some of those jobs, and my sisters, both much older than me, loved telling me that I always told Dad, I don't need to know that. And I said, why did I tell him that? Because you told Dad, and you couldn't pronounce it really well, but you said you were going to work at the Simley God Business House. Interesting. I don't know what God's called you to do. I don't have the foggiest. I'm not going to stand here today and tell you that I do. But God has placed a dream inside of every heart that is here under the sound of my voice. Because he knew you before you were even formed. And so he implanted a dream into you and there are times you may interpret the dream incorrectly but don't lose the dream that God has birthed within who you are as a follower of Jesus Christ. Be one who steps out by faith. Be one who says, I still believe in a God of the impossible. I still believe there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. I still believe in healing. But um, there's some processes of, of life that you may need to really begin to examine. A little while this afternoon, you will see my report to this district council printed for those. And in essence, I didn't want you to see it before because I think my Reader's Digest condensed version of my message that I'm preaching today is probably better than I'm delivering it. You'd be sitting there reading it. So uh, at any rate, I think, I think you and I need to come to the place in, in our lives where we say, God, what do you want out of me? What do you really want out of me? Three things I want to leave with you this afternoon that I feel very firmly about. Number one, re-examine your focus. Re-examine your focus. You see, we live in a world that is so widely encompassing. And, you know, I... I 
believe to a certain extent. We, we like to tell our sons and daughters you can be anything you want to be. I think part of that may be a lie, but I do agree with the underlying philosophy. And there were those who said that's why we need, please, I'm, don't, don't boo or hiss. There are those who felt that's why we needed a woman president so that then our young girls could say, see, you can be president. And I still believe, maybe in my lifetime, I may see a female president. I'm not, I'm not knocking that at all. I didn't know whether we would see a female general counsel executive person. We have one now. Third highest in the fellowship. General secretary. That we now can officially say Madam Secretary and be correct. I don't know what God has put in your heart. You may say it's impossible. I can't be that. I'm telling you all things are possible to him that believes. All things are possible. You may not understand how you get there. The path between point A and point B is not always a straight line like they teach you in geometry. There may be a lot of variation and fluctuations that you have to go through, but don't lose the dream that God has birthed within your heart. Understand that he made you, he formed you. The only thing I am saying, would you get a focus on what it is that God wants? Do you ever start out as a kid trying to mow a straight line in the yard? or perhaps run the rototiller in the garden, or maybe even hook the harnesses up behind mule. You soon discovered that the only way to do a straight line was not to look at where you've been, but to look at where you're going. There's a lot of us who spend more time looking at where we've been than where we're going. And I'm just going to encourage us this morning. Get your eyes on a focus. I, we love talking about Peter. What, what, what a ridiculous guy he was. And yet, as long as he had focus on the Messiah, when he stepped out of the boat to do what was the impossible, he succeeded. But when he got his eyes on everything else that was around him, he failed. I I'm disturbed at the number of people who start out to be a preacher and a follower of Jesus Christ in this life, but they get sidetracked with everything else under the sun. Now, now don't, don't get me wrong. I, I think we need to examine why we're here and what we're doing and what's our reason for being. Let me dig around. How does the church, how does the world know your church? Well, within this fellowship, I remember the day that we were known as Holy Rollers. Everybody in town knew it. I grew up close here, 421 East Federal, Drumright, Oklahoma, set the assembly church. It was the Holy Roller Church of Drumright. It was also known for something else. We don't dance. We don't wear shorts. Come on, isn't anyone here as old as I am? <laughs> no makeup. My mom had a powder box that she used. Am I, am I saying that because we've left some of those old paths, we've failed. No, no, I'm not. Hang, hang with me. No, I'm not. Because there again, it was focus. We got our attention on a lot of other things which were not important to the will of God. But before you become wanting to climb up the, the, the ladder of, of uh, criticism, before you get there, what are we known for today? is the assemblies of God 
a part of the Republican Party. I like the way you're shouting. Are we known as gay bashers? Are we known as anti-abortionists? Now, I know there are some who are saying, wait a minute, you're, you're getting really personal. You're starting to dig around into some morality issues. I am. Because I want to know what we're known as. There's a lot of reasons for us to have political agendas. But ladies and gentlemen, the political agenda has nothing to do with the church of Jesus Christ that has been born by the blood of the Lamb of a divine Savior. I, I know. I know. I prayed over this message, and I admitted to some, this isn't going to fly. But I'm going to preach it. You can do with me whatever you want. I want to be known as a church who believes the lost can come in and be found, who believes the drunkard can be set free, who believes the drug addict can find something other than a needle to meet their high. I want to be known as a church who can reach out to the gay and to the lesbian and to the lonely and to the destitute and the one that nobody else wants and to the backslider and to the unregenerated. I want to be known as a church that believes there's power in the blood of Jesus Christ, that believes a life can be changed and revolutionized by Almighty God. I am not the Republican Party. I am the party washed in the blood of Jesus. Focus. Focus. What do you want to be known for? Let's move on. I also want to be known as people of faith. Let me deal with that a moment. Faith. By your faith. Boy, there's a lot of things about this life you cannot possibly explain. Let, let me deal with one right off the bat. It has to do with money. If you don't put God first with your finances, you're going to be in a miserable shape sooner or later. Sooner or later, it will happen. I do not, I, I love math, I, I love I love reasoning. I like logic. I, I like to enter into debates with auditors. I'm, I, 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 that's okay. That's, that's in my environment. I'm right in there. They'll tell you I don't, I don't mind to express opinions. But, but here's the deal. I have never figured out how you could give 10% to God and the 90% would be greater than the 100% that you started with. I've never figured that out. It's impossible to figure out with the human mind. I've never been able to figure out how God can reach down his hand and provide a miraculous touch of healing. But he does, friend. My early days grew up in the time you never called the doctor. Not first. The doctor was way down the list. Can I tell you what many of our pastors do now when someone from our church calls and says they're sick? Well, have you been to the doctor? Did you go to the hospital? No, pastor, that's why I called you. Hang on. Do I believe in doctors? Yes. 
I would say that my very best personal friend is a man that I sometimes call my brother, and he's my medical doctor. I pastored him when I was at Capitol Hill. And often, when making hospital rounds, our patients would get he and I confused. I have prescribed medicine. <laughs> I was even allowed into the x-ray room where that they thought I was him, and I probably saw what I shouldn't have seen, but I was there. And I didn't want to humiliate the staff to tell them, no, I'm not really the doctor, so I tried to oblige and leave. There were times he'd go down the hall and he'd say, well, I was just down there with so-and-so and they thought that I was you. And he was making doctor calls. I said, that's great. What'd you do? He said, I prayed for him. <laughs> I want to tell us something, folk. Don't lose the power and the majesty of faith that can heal the sick, that can deliver the oppressed that can make the body into things it never thought it could be before. Come on, Assemblies of God folk. Do we believe in divine healing or is that just something from our past that we say, well, we used to believe in that. James said, if there's any sick among you, let them call for the emergency room. If there's any sick among you, let them dial 911. No, sir. It says if there's any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church. Anoint them with oil and the prayer of faith, hallelujah, is going to save the sick. Give an opportunity for God to still do a miracle within our lives and through our ministry. Dare to believe it. Dare to dream it. Dare to long for it. Initiate faith fresh and new in our life. Number three. Never lose the fire of Pentecost. Boy, it's amazing. Some folk, some of us have become hesitant about being Pentecostal. Because if we're Pentecostal, the world might not like us. If we're Pentecostal, we're gonna have some wildfire. And I'm gonna tell you something. If you're Pentecostal and you haven't experienced any wildfire, you're not Pentecostal. I mean, let's just call it like it is. There are some people who want to be something in name only. And whenever you start exercising the gifts of the Spirit, they all don't turn out clean. They get muddy. They get questionable. But I would a whole lot rather go into a group who is trying to find their way into the heart of God than I would to walk into a group who are so cold and lethargic that it's been so long since the Spirit of God ever breathed upon that a congregation that you can't stir them with ever any type of fire you will attend to light because they've already been told we don't do that. Like the way you're shouting. We're Pentecostal people. Hallelujah. You meet someone in the hall of Walmart. They say, I know you're a praying person. Would you pray for me? They say, well, come to church Sunday morning, 1045. No, no, that's not the deal. I say, absolutely, what do you need? I need healing in my body. When do you want it? I want it right now. Well, in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm gonna lay hands on you right now in front of the lettuce. And let us look to God. <laughs> we're, go 
<laughs> We're going to believe God right here. Now, if they didn't want it, they wouldn't have asked. So let me just clarify this. If they didn't want it, they wouldn't have asked. And so go ahead, buddy. Lay hands on them and ask God to gloriously touch them by the power of his Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Ghost comes on you, Speak in tongues. I said speak in tongues. Come on, folk. There's enough people running around in the aisles of Walmart that don't speak English anyhow. They won't have any idea what language you're speaking in. So go ahead and let it flow. Quit trying to hide behind a, 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 a facade of saying, well, I, I, can't, I can't yield to God. I can't yield to the Holy Spirit. No, sir, allow the gifts of the Holy Spirit to come up within your heart. Believe God for the fire of Pentecost to burn into this generation. You know, uh, we've made a lot of changes and I am, I am so happy. I really am. The church, our church, Oklahoma, Assemblies of God, our district council does not look anything like it used to many years ago. And I'm happy. But there's one thing we must be cautious of. With all of our modern advances, all of our enhanced praise and worship, all of our wonderful techniques of audiovisual. All of our smoke, lights, graphics, and maybe thank God for sermon.com. Maybe. Hear me. Don't lose the fire of the Holy Ghost upon who we are. Because the loss who steps into our midst, the drug addict who steps in, they've seen the best shows already. They have heard better music than you can put on on your stage. They've had better lighting effects They've had strobes, they've had smoke, they've had everything. Some of their smoke has even been enhanced with mind-altering drugs. They know everything already. You don't have to put on a show to convict, convince them of anything, but you do need to tell them there is a man whose name is Jesus Christ. He came to change how you're living. He came to transform your life. He came to put husbands and wives together again. He came to restore the brokenhearted. Be careful what you criticize. Be careful what you condemn. Because one day, someone may open your closet door. And it's not going to be a good experience. So what do we do? And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. My dear brother and sister, let it be known, I still believe in the Pentecostal fires of revival that will change the way people live. And if we want to make a difference in the morality of America, get their heart right with Jesus Christ, and then all of these external things are going to start taking care of themselves, you don't have to be known as the one who is crying out as an advocate for some moral cause, but be known as one who is crying out as an advocate for the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. No Know that he called you when you weren't even yet born. Know he laid his hand upon you before you ever existed and say, I am called to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And make that your goal, 